I should like to call your attention this evening to the great message which is to be found in the Gospel according to St. Matthew in the 24th chapter. I come back for the third time to a consideration of this most important chapter. And we are looking in particular at the first 14 verses. If you like in particular this evening, verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now, in this chapter, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is looking forward and giving his prophecy and his teaching concerning two main matters. The first is the destruction of the temple in the city of Jerusalem and indeed the destruction of the city of Jerusalem herself. And the second great matter is the end of the world. I needn't keep you this evening in reminding you again of the circumstances in which our Lord came to give this particular address. But we must bear this in mind that it was just at the end of his life, just before the cross. He knew what was coming. He was going to it steadfastly. And uh, he had been in the temple with his followers, and he walks out of the temple. But before he does so, he makes his prophecy concerning the destruction of the temple and the destruction of the whole city of Jerusalem. Then he walks out of the temple. And his disciples, having heard this and being surprised at it, call his attention to the buildings of the temple, their apparent solidity, their apparent everlasting character, as if to say, is this possible? And so our Lord begins to speak and says to them, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And then the disciples later begin to put their questions, saying thus, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And our Lord proceeds to deal with those various questions. That is the essential content of this great chapter. The end of Jerusalem. The end of of the world. Now I'm calling attention to all this, I say, because it seems to me to be such an urgent matter at a time like this. Even scientists are talking today about the end of the world, at least the possible end of the world. Philosophers and others are doing the same thing. This whole question, because of these new scientific discoveries and because of these horrible and terrible bombs, this whole question is being raised in perhaps a more acute form than ever before in the whole history of mankind as to whether the end of civilization and of the world may be something that is indeed at hand. Never in a sense has life been more uncertain, more insecure than now. Never has there been such confusion. And people are asking, and rightly asking questions, they say, what's it all mean? What is it all about? What is it that's gone wrong with the human race? At least, I say, every thoughtful person must of necessity be asking such questions. For there must be something radically wrong that mankind can be so foolish as to commit suicide, as it were, and to do things which may well lead to that. Well, now then, because of all this, I say people are asking these particular questions. And here in this chapter, we have our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ dealing with these very matters. But the vast masses of the people, it's obvious to everybody, are not concerned to listen to him. They're not interested in what he's got to say. They feel it's quite irrelevant, that that's an old message which people once believed, but which is outmoded. And as I was saying last Sunday night, they feel in particular that they've got one very good reason for not listening to it at all. And that is that they feel that it has already failed. 
Now we began dealing with that very subject last uh, Sunday evening. I come back to it tonight because it seems to me to be nothing less than tragic that there are masses of people in the world at this very moment who seem to be going headlong to destruction and uh, to a horrible eternity for one reason only, and that is that they've misunderstood the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if I can do anything by any simple word of mine uh, to enlighten any such who may be in this congregation, well, I shall consider the time well spent. I know of nothing that is so disturbing to me as that uh, with a gospel such as this available and facing us, that men and women won't even look at it, they won't even consider it, because they've uh, had such a complete misrepresentation of it that they feel, as I say, that it's already failed. Therefore, one of the most urgent tasks confronting us is to get rid of this false notion of the gospel. You have but to read the newspapers. You have but to listen to the various organs of propaganda and of publicity to realize that in this country at the present time it is this false view of the gospel that is being given the greatest amount of attention. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not concerned about getting any publicity for the evangelical view of the gospel as such. But it's obvious to the merest tyro in these matters that you've only got to express uh, strong opinions about this atomic bomb and so on, and you'll get the publicity. And that is, therefore, the idea of the general public as to what Christianity is. Their notion of Christianity is something like this, that it's just one of the, a number of great moral teachings, and uh, that its primary purpose is to deal with the problems of the world and to improve the world. That's their idea, that Christianity is a teaching which is meant to right the wrongs and lessen suffering, especially to banish war, to give us peace and enjoyment and allow mankind to go on living almost endlessly and improving and gradually developing towards perfection. Now, that, I think you'll agree, is the common view which is held with respect to this matter. Jesus Christ, what was he? Well, he was a kind of a political teacher, a social teacher. And he was especially concerned, they feel, about this question of war because his great theme was love. And he ended his life by dying upon a cross. What was that? Well, they say, there he was just putting into practice his own teaching. You see, the teaching is you mustn't hit back. You turn the other cheek. You never resist evil at all. And furthermore, that by thus just doing nothing but allowing the enemy to kill you if necessary, you will have such a moral influence upon your enemy that he'll break down and he'll say, I shouldn't have done that, and he'll never do it again. Now that is the teaching. That is precisely what is believed. That this is nothing, I say, but moral teaching and exhortation. That that is its program to improve the world and especially to get rid of war. And that the supreme example of this view of life and the way to live it is that which happened upon the cross when the Son of God in an utter condition of passivity allowed the world and his enemies to do even the worst unto him. Passive resistance. Now then, that I say is the controlling teaching. And therefore there are so many in the world tonight who say, well, yes, I know that's the teaching, but isn't it utterly futile? What has it achieved? What has it done? Now then, we spent our time last, Friday, last uh, Sunday evening in showing you how utterly and entirely wrong that teaching was. We simply took it along these lines, that to start with, uh, the gospel never promises and never offers uh, to improve the world. That indeed, it prophesies the exact opposite. We've got it in this very chapter. He says, look here, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. That's going on right to the end, he says. Indeed, it says that towards the end, uh, things are likely to get much worse. 
so that the world, far from improving inevitably, is going to get very much worse at the end. These kind of things, he says, wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and pestilences and famines, he says, these are but the beginnings of sorrows. Much worse is to come. And indeed we saw that in his teaching here, he not only says that the world is going to be like that, but he gives us an explanation of it and a reason for it. And the reason is the sin that is in the heart of men. And therefore, we sum it up like this. As regards the world, our Lord says, there is no hope. The world is a doomed world. It's a condemned world. The world is going to be destroyed. That's his teaching. As that temple is going to be destroyed in Jerusalem, he said, as this whole city is going to be raised to the ground, so at the end of the world there is going to be judgment and destruction. That's his teaching. He holds out no hope for the world. And therefore we deduce this. And this is the very message of the gospel. That our business is to be concerned about ourselves in such a world. Ah, but that is the very point which I want to deal with this evening. Precisely, says the modern man. Now, that's it. That's your evangelical teaching. Now, this is being said very freely. You evangelicals, they say, you are just interested in your own little soul and in your personal salvation. Why, they say, look at it. In the whole world as it is this evening, with all these terrible forces massing themselves, and the whole world in its present state, you people are concerned just about saving your own little souls. Why, they say, it's so selfish, it's so small, it's so self-centered. Why not forget yourselves and go out and do something politically and socially and try and make the world a better place? Come out, they say, of this narrow, selfish, cramped little position. And do something about the great world that's outside. And of course, that's the sort of thing that appeals to the newspaper reporters. You see, it's a social, political matter. So this is the thing, this is Christianity. There is this criticism of our personal salvation, our personal emphasis. Now, as that is the controlling idea, I feel that I must... Try to deal with it, God helping me. It's to me, I say, the supreme tragedy, the last tragedy. That any man should ever find himself in hell for all eternity because of this tragic misrepresentation of the gospel. I speak with fervor, I speak with feeling for this reason, that as a preacher of the gospel, I know that I shall have to stand and give an account of my own preaching and my own ministry. I know that I shall have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Therefore, I say with the Apostle Paul, knowing the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. I have a horror of finding myself at that judgment throne and being asked this question. Why didn't you disabuse the minds of those people? Why didn't you tell them that the impression of Christianity that's given in the daily newspapers is a lie and a travesty and is not the truth? Why didn't you make it plain to them? Why didn't you alarm them into seeing it? That's why I come back to this subject this evening. It's on my conscience. I have a concern. Very well then, I take it up and let me try to deal with it as briefly as I can in this way. What is our reply to this charge? That the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it's represented evangelically, is narrow and selfish. Instead of taking its big world view, and instead of dealing with the world situation politically and socially. Well, my answers would be these. This other teaching that does that is guilty in that way of putting the world before the individual. And that is something which I think I can show you. The Bible never does. It is something which the Lord Jesus Christ never did. Do you know that he was even criticized for not doing it? You see, even John the Baptist seems to have stumbled a little bit at this point. Our Lord was there spending most of his time up in Galilee. 
preaching to a crowd of very poor and very humble people. He didn't spend the whole of his time up in Jerusalem. He didn't spend his time in addressing the Sanhedrin. He didn't spend his time in drawing up resolutions to be sent to the emperor at Rome to right this political injustice or to put that social wrong right. Not a word. Nothing. Never did it at all. He didn't seem to be concerned about these great things that were happening in the world at that very time. What does he do? Well, he preaches to a handful of simple, ordinary, apparently illiterate poor people. And you see, even John the Baptist is a bit troubled. Poor John, he'd been lying there in prison for some six months. And so one day he picked out two of his followers and he said, go up to him. And he sent them and this was their question, art thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? What John meant, you see, was this, look here, is it conceivable that you really are the Messiah and that you're spending your time in this way? Why don't you go up to Jerusalem? Why don't you set yourself up as the Jewish Messiah? Why don't you become a king? Why don't you raise an army? Go back, said our Lord, to these two men and tell John again the things that you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf are made to hear, the dead are raised, and the gospel is being preached to the poor, to the poor. And blessed is he that is not offended in me. For John, you see, was on the verge of being offended. He felt this wasn't the program of the Messiah. He'd misunderstood it. He'd got this big view instead of this personal view that our Lord was teaching and following. And, of course, you remember that his own brothers uh, did exactly the same thing with him. In the seventh chapter of the Gospel, according to St. John, you will find that his brothers came to him one day and said, Look here, don't you know that there's a great, great feast on in Jerusalem? Why don't you go up and declare yourself? If you really are what you say, if you really believe what you're teaching, why don't you go up to Jerusalem and declare yourself? No man, they say, who's got... The policy that you have and who claims what you claim, he doesn't hide himself. He goes up and declares himself. Why don't you go and do it? And again you read in John's Gospel that after our Lord had worked the miracle of feeding the 5,000, we are told this. And they came and they tried to take him by force to make him a king. They'd seen the miracle and they were amazed. They said, this must be the Messiah. Well, now let's take hold of him. He seems to be a little bit diffident. He seems to be too modest. He's meant to be a king. They came and they tried by force to take him and to make him a king. That's John 6, 15. And when he saw that they would try and take him by force to make him a king, Jesus departed up into a mountain himself alone. He wouldn't be made a king. He hasn't come to do that. A man comes to him one day in the middle of a sermon and he says, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he turned to him and he said, Man, who hath made me a judge or a divider over you? I haven't come from heaven to earth in order to deal with things like that. I'm not a legal department. I'm not a social department. No, no, that's not my calling. And he begins to speak to them personally. Well, I could give you endless illustrations of the same thing. Our Lord always spoke to the individual. You know, the whole of the Sermon on the Mount is spoken to individuals. That's where these other people go so wrong. He wasn't addressing nations. He wasn't speaking to companies of people. He was speaking to the individual. He said, thee and thou, if this happens to you, personal individual. He wasn't talking about nations. The Christian ethic was never meant for nations. It is meant for the individual Christian believer who is poor in spirit and meek and who hungers and thirsts after righteousness and who mourns because of his sins. He is always speaking to the individual. And here in this great chapter where he's even dealing with the destruction of a city and talking about the end of the world, his message is to individuals. Because of this, he says, what are you going to do about it? He's talking to the individual. He always did. Oh, there are some glorious examples and illustrations of this. And oh, how they do violence to him, leave alone his teaching, who deny this pint and do try to ridicule it. Do you see him on one occasion? 
going to the house of a man called Jairus, whose little daughter was desperately ill and at the point of death. And there was a great crowd following him. He was thronged by a great crowd. But suddenly he spoke and he uttered a very strange word. It baffled the disciples. He said, who hath touched me? And the disciples said, thou seest the crowd thronging thee. And sayest thou, who hath touched me? They said, a thousand people are in a sense touching you. And are you asking, who touched me? Are you interested in individuals? Oh yes, said our Lord. I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. Some individual has touched me. And of course he was right. There was a poor woman in that great crowd, a woman with an issue of blood, who had suffered like this for many years and had tried many physicians, we are told, but was nothing better but rather made worse. This poor woman, this solitary individual, this unknown woman, was there in the throng and in the crowd with her personal individual need, and she just touched the hem of his garment, and he knew, and he said, who touched me? He was concerned about her. The whole procession was held up while he dealt with this one woman. That's his method. These people who wouldn't represent him today say they have no time for the individual. They're concerned with these great issues. Yes, and to that extent they're denying their own Lord and Master. But look at the supreme illustration and example of this. There he is, crucified on a tree, dying on a cross, with the weight of the sins of his people upon him, this awful, terrible weight that makes him cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's doing something eternal. He's dying. Yes, he's dying for the sins of the whole world in that sense. And yet you remember that he's concerned about one of the thieves dying by his side. And when this man begins to speak to him and says, we are dying justly, but you are dying unjustly. You've never done any wrong at all, Lord. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Here is the one, I say, who's doing something cosmic and eternal, the one in whom things in heaven and earth and under the earth are all going to be reunited and reconciled to God. He's got upon him the weight of this universe, as it were. And yet one individual in the midst of all that says, Remember me! Did he turn to him and say, Men, what are you talking about? I can't be interested in individuals. Don't be so personal. Don't be so selfish. I'm considered in, uh, concerned about this cosmic matter. Not a word. He turned to this one man and he spoke to him. At such an hour, at such a moment, with such a weight upon him and, and said today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. Oh, that's the Christian message, the Christian gospel. Thank God for it. That was his manner. That was his method. That was the way in which he always behaved. And as you go on and watch his followers in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, you'll always find that they did exactly the same thing. I see no record whatsoever of the apostles meeting together in council to draw up a number of resolutions to send to a town council or a county council or a parliament or a prime minister or an emperor or anybody else. Not a word. They simply didn't do it. What did they do? They preached to the individuals who were in front of them. And they spoke to them not about these great general questions. They spoke to them about their souls, about their condition, about their position. I ask you to read your New Testament. You needn't take my word for it. There it is. Isn't that the four Gospels? Isn't that the book of Acts? Isn't that the message of all the epistles? And of course it is. And for this good reason. This message starts with the fundamental proposition that the world as such cannot be reformed. I mean by that in an ultimate sense. There are temporary improvements, but you go back again. As even some of the historians are teaching us, the world goes round and round in cycles. You think you're going up, ah, you suddenly find you're going down the other side. 
There's no line of general advance. Civilizations come and they go. No, no. The Bible starts with it as a fundamental proposition that the world, because it sinned, because it listened to the devil, has fallen. And the world, qua world, is under the doom and the curse and the wrath and the damnation of God. I mustn't stay with this. I tried to bring that out last uh, Sunday evening. That is his pronouncement about the world. It cannot be improved. And therefore, I say, to give all your time to that is a waste of energy. You're trying to do something that he says cannot be done. He says there will be wars. There'll be rumors of wars. There'll be all these things. Do what you will. You can't stop it. Very well, then. If that is so, what has the gospel got to say? Oh, this is exactly what it has to say. That though the world, qua world, is under this doom and damnation of God, and that nothing can save it from that final disaster and end, that nevertheless, individuals can be saved out of it. Individuals. The world can't be saved, but you and I can be saved. Now, that is the essential message of the gospel. The other is a lie because he says, it's not going to be done, it cannot be done. The doom is coming for certain. But here he comes in with his gospel. In spite of the doom of the world, you and I can be delivered, can be rescued. Why should we be concerned about this? Well, isn't it obvious? We are, after all, individuals. The world is made up of individuals. We come into this world one by one. You see, we are also governed by this mass psychology today, this mob psychology, that we are forgetting some of the most fundamental truths about life. You can mass produce motor cars, but not children, babies. You're born one by one. And that puts a stamp on individuality. Ah, oh, you say, but we're all human beings. I know we are, but we're all individuals and we're all different. And don't we all know this full well that in spite of all the things that we share and enjoy together in community, the really big and important things in life we do one by one. Oh, I'm not surprised that an atheistical communism is doing away with the whole idea of marriage and the home. It suits their book. But you see, that isn't the biblical way. The biblical way is marriage. One man, one woman coming together. That's its essential teaching. No promiscuity here. We are not animals in a jungle. One man, one woman. These twain shall be made one flesh, individuality. We don't love in the mass, do we? We love as individuals. And we pick out another individual. We are attracted by an individual. And we love that individual. How monstrous it is to try and get rid of this most glorious thing that pertains to us with these mass notions and ideas. No, no, the big things in life are all personal. Our joys are personal. Our sorrows are personal. The heart knoweth its own bitterness. You can feel absolutely alone in this great city of London with its teeming millions. You say, it's all right, I see them rushing and they're apparently happy, but I'm not. And you're left alone with your own misery and your own problems and your own unhappiness. We are alone. We are individuals. All these great things are individual. And as we were born singly and alone, we will die singly and alone. A lot of us may die at the same time, but still you die as an individual. And every one goes through it himself alone. And we go on into eternity in exactly the same way, alone. And that is why I say you should be concerned about this. 
Stop thinking of the world for a moment. That world is doomed. That world is going to disaster. You can do what you like. I'm not saying you shouldn't have politics. Indeed, I could argue very easily that God has ordained politics to keep the world within order and within bounds, but nothing more than that. Well, I say go on with that if you like, but don't say that that's the gospel. The gospel is to save us from the fate and the doom that's coming to that mass, that world. We can be taken out of it. That's its glorious promise. That is the good news. So I say that any representation of this message, this gospel, which doesn't start with the individual and end with him, which doesn't emphasize the importance of the individual, is a denial of it. It's a travesty of it. My dear friend, this is the position. The world and all who belong to it is going to that doom and that disaster. What about you? You do what you like, you sweat, you work, you do anything, join every organization that you can conceive of. To try and stop that, you won't stop it. It's coming. Very well then, I say, the essence of wisdom is this. Am I irretrievably bound up with that? Can nothing be done? Is there no way of escape? Am I inextricably involved in this doom and final destruction? The Bible says, no, you're not. You, as an individual, count in the sight of God. Didn't you notice the teaching? The very hairs of your head are all numbered. The God who made the whole universe out of nothing. The God who plays with the stars and the constellations, even as a child with marbles. The God who said, let there be and there was. This infinite, eternal, everlasting God is interested in us one by one. And we're all accountable to him One by one, the gospel of Jesus Christ is individualistic. It is personal. It sees no hope for the world. It sees every hope for the individual who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh yes, we must assert this and say that the other is the lie of hell. It's a misrepresentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is misleading the masses of the people. But let me say a second thing. This other teaching puts the body before the soul. I don't hesitate to say that. Have you ever noticed so much concern about the destruction of the body as you have at the present time? Did you read that debate in the House of Lords only this last week? And that's what most of them were concerned about, you know, the destruction of the body. The body is more important than the soul. They don't believe in the soul. These great philosophers, they think of men as but an animal. It's a body. That's the thing they're interested in. And, of course, death is regarded as the supreme calamity. Nothing is more terrible to them than death. Why this? If you don't stop this, if we don't renounce the bomb in this country and set a moral example and shock the world out of its folly. Why, they say, we're all going to be killed together, and that's the last calamity, that's the most awful thing. If we are killed, why, that's the end, and there's no more. That's their view. There is nothing to them that is worse than death. And you notice that at once, they're in a position that is entirely different from that which is taught in the Bible, and especially in the New Testament. The whole teaching of the New Testament is this, that the important thing about a man is not his body, but his soul. What shall it profit a man, though he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What's the man in this world for? Is it to preserve his body? Is it just to keep on living? Is it just to extend the number of years that he's in this world? What a view of life. What a view of man. Mere extension of the number of years so that I go on living a little bit longer in this world, this present evil world. That's the view. Death, the final calamity. Nothing more terrible than death. But you notice from my reading at the beginning that that wasn't our Lord's view. Listen to him. You see, these disciples of his were afraid of death, and death to them was the most awful thing that could happen. He's sending them out to preach. 
And he says, now be careful. Don't you think that everybody's going to receive you with open arms because they're not going to? You will be hated of all men for my name's sake. Don't think they said they'll open your arms and embrace you. No, no, they'll take up stones and throw them at you as they've done with me. They'll arrest you, they'll try you before their synagogues, and they'll take you before their magistrates. Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Indeed, he said, they may even arrest you and put you to death. And then he said this wonderful thing. Fear not them that are able to kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. The gospel according to St. Luke chapter 12 is the same passage even better. It puts it like this. Fear not them that are able to kill the body but after that have nothing that they can do unto you. But rather I say unto you Fear him which hath power to destroy both soul and body in hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. This is his view. He says, don't be afraid of men. Men, after all, can only destroy your bodies. The utmost that a man can do is to kill you and to destroy your body, but he can't do more. He can't touch your soul. But you see, today the whole of the emphasis is upon the body. We're going to be killed. Our bodies are going to be destroyed. And this is the excitement. Our life in this world must be extended. And if we're shortened by a year, what a terrible thing it is. Living in this world, it's everything. And any view which thus puts its emphasis upon the life of the body at the expense of the life of the soul and that gives the impression that the supreme calamity is the death of the body, is a denial of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, I'll tell you what the final calamity is, the death of the soul. He that saveth his life shall lose it. Let's say these men got their way, and that all the bombs were destroyed. They've saved their lives. There's never to be another war. Man has signed an agreement. Never another. Of course, it'll never happen. The Bible has told us it won't. But let's even assume that it did happen. They've saved their lives. What have they saved? Oh, they've only saved the life of a body for an extra few days, perhaps weeks, perhaps months, perhaps years. He that saveth his life shall lose it. But he that loseth his life for my sake shall save it. What makes a man a man is his soul, not his body. And the thing to be concerned about and alarmed about is the man's soul. But all the attention today is on the body. And Christian pulpits are given over to preaching the salvation of the body. And only a few years at most because it's still got to die. Bombs or not, wars or not. And where's the soul? Ah, oh, they say, but that's selfish, self-centered. You're just a little individual talking about saving your own little soul. Oh, yes, I want to save my soul. I'll tell you why. It isn't a little thing. It's the biggest thing of all. It's the thing that God breathed into me. It's the thing that goes on to all eternity. It's my body that's small. This is only temporary. This is only a tabernacle that I'm in for a while. The soul, it's the biggest thing in the universe. It's bigger than the whole world itself. What shall it profit a man? Though he gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Well, let me hurry on. My next argument is this that this other representation uh, puts life in this world before life in the next. It follows, doesn't it, from what I've just been saying. And if there is anything that is completely and entirely unchristian, it is that. Of course, you know the way of putting it, don't you? You know the clever way of putting it. When I say clever, I mean the way in which it's put by Tom, Dick and Harry on the street corner and Tom, Dick and Harry on the brains trust on Sunday afternoon. Because there is no difference between them. None at all. Tom, Dick and Harry put it like this. We are not interested, they say, in your pie in the sky. Pie in the sky. Practical men of reality, this world. Well, all they're doing, I say, is to proclaim that they're in an exact opposite position from the Scriptures. Let me grant them this. They're perfectly logical. They have no conception of the soul. They have no conception of man made in the image of God. 
And they believe that when a man dies, it's exactly like that flower dying, like a tree falling or a horse falling dead. It's the end. They know of nothing beyond this world, and that's why they're so concerned about living in this, you see. That's why they get excited about these bombs and think that Christianity's main business is to stop war, extending life in this world. Why? Well, because they know nothing of another world. I say they're perfectly logical. But it is the very antithesis of the Christian position and the Christian teaching. What is the Christian teaching on this matter? It's this. Let me give you a summary of it. The Christian teaching does not despise life in this world. Of course it doesn't. It says it's God's world. And it says we should make a right and a full use of it. We should use it but not abuse it. It says we should make it as beautiful as we can and we should have it as ordered as is possible. Why? Well, because it's God's world. No, no, Christianity doesn't despise life in this world. Well, what does it do? It takes a true view of it. And what is the true view of it? Well, I've told you. It says this world is as it is because of sin, because of men's rebellion against God, because of men's disobedience. He says, it says men, in many ways, has made life in this world a living hell. This is the typical New Testament attitude. Let me quote to you the words of the Apostle Paul. In this tabernacle we do groan, being burdened. This, my friends, is a land of sin and woe. The world, according to this view, is indeed a terrible place. And don't you begin to agree? Read your newspapers. Look what's happening. The world, says the scripture, is a terrible place. Very well. But you see, it goes on to say this. This is not the only world. There is another world. Our light affliction, says the Apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And if the earthly house of this our tabernacle were dissolved, if we die, we have a building of God and house not made in, with hands eternal in the heavens. That's the Christian view and the Christian teaching. Death is not the end. Death is but the end of a life of sin and shame. Death is but going out of this evil world with all its horrors and all its bestiality. Where to? Well, to be with Christ, which is far better. To me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Or look at the 11th chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. Look at all those mighty men who are mentioned there. Noah and all the rest of them. Abram, Moses, all these mighty men. What was their view of life? Well, they said, we are not living for this world. We are strangers and pilgrims. These men have got their eyes set upon another land. They accounted themselves strangers and pilgrims in the world. They were seeking for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. They said, no, no, even temples collapse. Even the whole world is going. We don't live for this. We are but strangers and pilgrims. We are sojourners and travelers. We are making for our home. There is a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's the Christian teaching. The Christian teaching, you see, puts its main emphasis upon the world that is to come. We are only travelers here. We are not here forever. But there, we are going to be there forever. This is a transient, temporary life. And isn't a man who doesn't believe that a fool? It's true of all of us. But that life hath no ending. It's eternal. It's everlasting. 
So all this emphasis on the present rather than the future, this world rather than the next, is an utter denial of Christianity. And yet you notice so much today is represented as Christianity which puts the whole of its emphasis upon this present world. And lastly, and for me to close, What I object to supremely about this travesty of Christianity, this gross misrepresentation of it, this lie that is issued in the name of Christ, is this. That it would rob him of his central glory. And his central glory is to be found in his death upon the cross. What was he doing there? Ah, we are told, as I've reminded you, that that is the supreme illustration of passive resistance. He was just putting into practice his own teaching. And his own teaching is, don't defend yourself. So you apply that to nations. You say, don't rearm. And, they said, his teaching is this, that if you only do that and give this illustration and example, this gesture of love, why, the other nations will be shocked. Because you've destroyed your bombs, they'll destroy their bombs. And there'll never be another war. If only one nation did it, the example, the illustration, the moral influence would be so shattering upon the others, they'd all immediately send away all their armies, destroy all their bombs, and turn all their swords into plowshares. That's his teaching. This. He's simply calling upon us to do it. And if we all just refuse to fight and to do these things as he did upon the cross, the whole course of human history would be changed. That's their representation of the cross. Oh, what a travesty. Is that but a moral gesture? Is that nothing but passive resistance? Is he simply there because he hasn't chosen to defend himself? God knows. What a lie. He set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. It wasn't that he was caught or taken there. He went there deliberately. He knew what was going to happen. He said, for this hour came I into this world. What has he come for? The Son of Man is not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the whole world. Or if I may again quote the author of the epistle to the Hebrews in his second chapter and in his ninth verse, who has made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that he might taste death for every man. My dear friend, there on that cross was happening the biggest, the most momentous thing the world has ever known or ever can. What was it? It was a transaction between the Son of God and God the Father. It was the Heavenly Father taking these sins of yours and mine and putting them on his own Son. And it was he who smote him. It wasn't men. It was God. Wounded for our transgressions. Smitten for our iniquities. No, no, the cross of Christ has never had this moral influence upon anybody. But what it has had is this. It is the power of God unto salvation. It is God's way of rescuing, redeeming individuals. Their sins were laid upon the Son. He came in order to die. His death was not a calamity. It wasn't an accident. It didn't result from the malignity of men. No, no. God sent him to die. He said, here am I. Send me in the eternal council. And when the fullness of the times was come, God sent him. 
He came deliberately to die. His purpose was to die. Because without this death of his, there would be no deliverance, no redemption, no rescue for any single individual. My dear friend, the world is doomed that you can be saved out of the doom and the destruction. And all you have to do is to realize that the Son of God can save you from it. For he has borne your sins that lead with the sins of others to that doom. And in him they can be forgiven. In him you can be reconciled to God. So that when the final calamity and disaster comes, you will not be involved is this narrow pity selfishness? I say it is eminently common sense. The world cannot be saved. You can. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Be ye saved. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.